Hello and welcome to Motor Week. On today's program, Elisa Portelli takes a drive in the Saab 95 Aero, the slightly less boxy estate from Scandinavia. We take a look at the innovative Honda Insight, and Ken Gibson gets all the best cars as he lords it up in a fab new Bentley, whilst Richard drives a body-kitted Fiat Multipler. Oh yes, kicking dude, mad for it. Absolutely crazy for a wicked weekend. Oh, I do feel pretty mad and bad in this thing, it's gotta be said. Come on my bespoiled beauty, aha. Have I got to? You wanna see it all? You are sure about this? Well do me one favor, before I show you the whole vehicle, just look at me, and now think of the funniest thing that you've ever encountered, okay? The funniest thing, because you are going to need your sense of humour at full speed. There it is! The multipler with body kit. Oh, yes. I mean... This is, um... And then we've got... And a long... Look, what's... <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> what? What the big tyres? <laughs> ah. So there it is, the Fiat Multipler with a body kit. And this isn't some nutty one off that somebody's made out of cornflake packets. This is actually offered by Fiat. It is a real option. But before we look further, let's remind ourselves just what we've got here. If you haven't met one of these before, then don't be frightened. And don't go thinking that underneath all the body kit there lies a fairly ordinary and mundane looking car. Because the, the thing looks absolutely nuts with or without the body kit. First arrived in the UK mid-1999 and not surprisingly made a bit of a splash straight away. But it's not a case of just design for design's sake and just looking daft for the sake of turning our heads and creating a stir. There are good reasons for its shape. These very straight sides clear up a lot of space. On the inside, the fact that you've got three seats across the front is extremely practical. And it also means you can seat six people and still have enough room in the back for all the luggage in a comparatively small car. Fiat reckon that the headlamps mounted in the bulge over the bonnet are to stop the lights bouncing around too much over the bumps. I think that's just a case of making excuses for the way it looks. It's the kind of thing you tell your mates in the pub. That's why it looks like it does. All this glass makes for brilliant visibility all round, but don't forget, this is a car that a lot of people are going to stare at, and they can see in very easily, which means it's not a car to put your nose in. The more you persevere and look beyond the wacky image of the multiplayer, the more you find actually some really practical, sensible stuff driving it. It's great. This has got the turbo diesel engine and I'd advise not going for the petrol. It's really strong, really talky, pulls from nowhere. And the whole thing is a doddle to drive. It doesn't lean and wallow. And having the gear lever mounted up on the dash is superb. Apart from clearing space for the middle passenger's feet, it's right next to the steering wheel. The instrument binnacle may look like something from a 1950s robot movie, but it's actually, again, really ergonomically practical. The great big central dial with the speedo is just in the right place. You don't really need anything else. Who cares about revs? Now, OK, it may not seem the most sensible thing in the world to take a mini people carrier and to stick a body kit on it that's more suited to some 17-year-old's hot hatch. But this is the Fiat Multipler. It's not like anything else. And the comfort that you can take is that underneath all these wacky looks, there's actually some fairly compelling and sensible reasons for having one. So if ever anybody questions you, that's your answer. Why did you do it? Hell, why not?
If you asked people what type of Saab would you buy, they'd say one with jets, wings and guns. But let's face it, you're not going to get finance over five years for that and it's just not practical. So that brings us on to load space and this, the new 95 Aero Estate. Saab claimed that it's built with an eye to practicality before image and I agree. I'd much rather have a ravishing little roadster any day, but give it its due, it seems to be a little bit sporty with the low chassis, a front chin spoiler, contoured side sills and these Wicked Boy Racer 17 inch alloy wheels. So to the important bit now, you just drop your kids off at school and you're on your way back home for a nice cup of coffee with the girlies. But you need to make a stop off at the supermarket. And the all important question is, how much can we get in here? I've got my friend here, Gary. Come on, Gary, give us a hand. Let's bring these trolleys around here. Look at this, watch. Lift this up. Hey, out comes your little tray there. Let's stack it up on there then, Gary. I'm not very good at packing, am I, Gary? No. <sighs> Thank you, Gary. You're a star. See ya. The 95 Aero has a 2.3 litre turbocharged engine, which can deliver 230 brake horsepower, which is more than enough to get you from the car park to your front drive with a full load. For me, Saab will always be associated with very natural people. The type that spend their Sunday afternoons putting their stuff into recycling bins, like vegans. So needless to say, the 95 feels cautious and safe on the road, but put your foot down and you're in for a surprise. From rest to 60 miles per hour, it takes this family estate just 6.5 seconds. That's more than enough to make your Birkenstocks curl. That's down to the Saab overboost function, which gives you more power to accelerate. That's all good and well when you're tearing down the high street for that hair appointment, girls. But what about trying to back this into your drive when it's full of shopping, the kids and Fido? On those long family holidays or even day trips, I think that the Saab will prove to be successful. The sport chassis is rigid enough to cope with all that extra power and I think it handles the bends rather well. What's more is the manual traction control comes as standard. The only criticism is that over long distances the drive isn't perhaps as involving as a driver may want. That's the long-winded way of saying it's a little bit boring, but whoever said practicality had to be exciting. Inside it's functional, grey and rather boring. The driving position is comfortable though and the leather seats, well they're quite nice but you do have to pay extra for them. The centre console here, well, it's grey and it's dull, but for a few extra quid, you could go for that wooden finish. And as you would expect, it's got a great in-car stereo system and more airbags and side impact bars than you can shake a stick at. At a shade under 24,000 for the 2-litre engine version and just under 27,000 for the 2.3-litre, it competes very well against the likes of Volvo and BMW. And they also last a long time, which is probably why they don't evoke much excitement. There are still many old ones on the road today. Now, if I had to choose between the Saab or maybe even one of its competitors, the Volvo, or a Subaru Legacy, which has 4x4 and is a little bit cheaper, I still would go for the Saab 95. As a family estate, it has a wonderful drive and I think it looks fantastic too. But then I haven't got a family, I'm not practical, and I'd probably go for something a little bit smaller, faster and a lot more fun. It's very difficult to predict just how long reserves of oil will last for. And in a world dependent on cars, new ways of propelling vehicles have to be devised. 
Current discoveries of oil last for 40 to 50 years, but as new finds are made, that just rolls on. But eventually, sometime, it has to stop. Probably not in our lifetime, so car makers are devising economical alternatives to the combustion engine. The Honda Insight is one of those cars and will go on sale in the UK this spring. It's a hybrid vehicle, so it uses a tiny three-cylinder 995cc petrol engine alongside an electric motor. The two work together to provide the Insight with realistic performance. It's a super clean vehicle with what they call super ultra low emissions, different from a zero emission vehicle which would run solely on battery electric power. Although battery powered cars are clean and a familiar sight on the roads of California, the problem is how long the power lasts for before needing to be charged again. Enter the hybrid vehicle. The Insight is not the world's first hybrid car. Toyota have their Prius small medium sized saloon car, which has been on sale for 18 months in Japan and will also come to the UK soon. The Insight, like Audi's A2 and A8, is an aluminium car, which contributes to a large weight saving, weighing in at just 835 kilograms. It's perhaps the shape of the car which takes most getting used to. But it's the Insight's economy which dictates that. A very low drag means near 90 miles per gallon, 750 miles on 30 pounds worth of fuel. The Insight looks very much like other electric cars, and I can think of one produced by General Motors a couple of years ago, which seems identical. It's also not unlike an old Citroen. The Insight uses a battery specially developed in conjunction with Panasonic. It weighs just 20 kilograms and produces 144 volts of power. It's the size of two shoeboxes and should last for around 10 years. The battery only charges to a maximum of 80% to prolong its life, and because it's a hybrid vehicle, it recharges whilst on the move. Honda engineers in development decided that the Insight must have the performance of a 1.5 Honda Civic, which was used as the benchmark. It's no use having this sort of technology if the car has the performance of a milk float, which it certainly doesn't. 300 patents are pending on the Insight, such as its revolutionary design. So, what's the Insight like to drive? Well, very good. You could be forgiven for thinking that this sort of vehicle wasn't fun, but here at the Croft Circuit in Darlington, those fears were easily dispelled. It's fairly quick, it's quiet, it's responsive. Sure, you don't get a kick in the back under acceleration, but the car responds well. Handling and ride are also surprisingly good. So, if you want a car that is amazingly economical, environmentally friendly and good to drive, the Insight might be just the car for you. Hybrid vehicles have certainly come a long way. And don't worry, this is no milk float. Join us after the break when Ken Gibson test drives the Bentley. As you can see, I've got on my very best clothes. I've got the stately home to match. And the reason for this move up market in my image is this, the Bentley Arnage red label. The latest thoroughbred in a long line of classics from Bentley, one of the most famous car names in the world. And this is just awesome to my eyes. Bentley is still one of the few cars that remains instantly recognizable all over the world. And in recent years, it's definitely outshone its famous stablemate Rolls-Royce. One look at the Bentley red label tells you why. This car has got class with a capital C, from the impossible to ignore grille to its elegant rear end. What I like about the Bentley is, unlike its famous stablemate, the Rolls-Royce, it's got a much wider appeal. Everybody from pop stars, Hollywood legends, obviously the rich, but even lottery winners all go for the Bentley. It's got something different. But the thing that I really like about it is that beneath the distinguished exterior, this wonderfully lavish interior, is something rather special, and it's this. Turn the key and blip the accelerator, and the sound hints at the awesome power of the Red Label's 6.7-litre turbocharged V8. The 
thing about the Red Label is that it turns you into a real Jekyll and Hyde type of character. One minute you're going along silently, serenely, and then the next minute, by pressing this small button here, you have liftoff. It's a little bit like Houston, we have liftoff. I'm talking 0 to 60 miles an hour in under six seconds and a limited top speed of 155, which is pretty impressive for a car that weighs nearly two ton. The Bentley, it's got stiffened suspension, a stiffened body shell, and it gives it an amazing agility for a car that's just under 18 foot long and just over six foot wide. The way it handles really does take some believing at times. Bentley, of course, is now owned by Volkswagen. Yes, I know, yet another German company with a big hold on a British company. But in fairness, they've invested over 500 million in a range of new models, including the new red label. And I think they've made a damn good job of it. In fact, this car goes to prove that the best of British and the best of German can work very well together to produce a really good car. It's also crammed full of the latest technology, hidden discreetly behind a traditional forest of wood and a herd of cows worth of leather seats. Oh, I almost forgot the price. It actually seems rather vulgar to mention it, but it is actually a very modest £149,000. And that, in supercar terms, is pretty close to a bargain. Unfortunately, those very nice people from Bentley now want the keys back, and that means I'm off to get the bus. Vauxhall and General Motors have probably never had it so good because in the past five years their flagship Amiga has been consistently at the top of the executive car charts. In that time they've beaten off the likes of the Ford Scorpio and the Rover 800. They've literally beaten those two cars into submission. The quirky frog-eyed Scorpio we never really took to and the Rover 800 after all was just a rover. So Vauxhall have taken the decision to freshen the Amiga range up, give it a new lease of life for the next three to four years before their next generation executive saloons and estates arrive. With a new bonnet and boot, new front and rear lights, colour keyed bumpers and sills, the base 2 litre engines don't really offer much get up and go with a new 2.2 litre four cylinder engine. That now makes, if my sums are right, five engines to choose from. The entry level 2 litre 16 valve, the new to the range 2.2, the 2.5 V6, the 2.5 turbo diesel and the 3 litre V6, all available in manual or auto and in saloon or estate. Now, moving inside, again, it's an all-new interior. Vauxhall have tried to create, well, a touch of luxury, and I think they've pretty much succeeded. The dashboard has a soft-touch feel to it. There's a new centre console with heating and ventilation controls and a brand-new stereo system, too. Now, Vauxhall, like most manufacturers, are incorporating a satellite navigation system into the car, and you can have the option of a 5-inch television monitor screen right there, giving you the sat-nav. There's plenty of space for passengers and some handy storage bins too. It has to be said that the Amiga was always a decent car to drive. Rear wheel drive, a decent chassis and setup. And if you pick the 3 litre V6, well, a real stormer of an engine. 211 brake horsepower on tap and very respectable 0 to 60 times of just over eight seconds, top speed of 150 miles an hour. The 3 litre V6, of course, continues into the new range in either Elite or MV6 form. This is the MV6, and this, in my opinion, is the pick of the bunch. It gets a lowered speed sport suspension by 15 millimeters, stiffer ride, a touch anyway, and unique alloy wheels and an aluminium dashboard.
The 2.2-litre engine already seen in the Sintra produces 144 brake horsepower, and the 2.5 V6 gets 170. If you must have diesel, well, you can have the 2.5-litre inline six with 130 brake horsepower. But stand by because next year a flagship Amiga will be available with an aluminium 300 brake horsepower V8 engine, the same as we've seen in the Corvette. Now, although Vauxhall make great play of competing with the main German manufacturers like Mercedes, BMW and Audi, in reality, the user-chooser company car driver who has perhaps 25 to 30,000 pounds to spend on their next car, well, I'm afraid they're going to choose an E-Class or an A6 or a 5 Series over the Amiga, no matter how good this car is. The company car driver who doesn't have a choice, well, this is no bad car to have in their driveway. But perhaps the main rivals for the new Amiga are the Saab 95, the Volvo S80 or the new Rover 75. So the Amiga, not before time, has had a very welcome facelift, and that's really all that's happened with the car. The underpinnings remain the same as the outgoing Amiga model. It's very spacious, it's extremely well built. It's a car that can take on the might of Mercedes, BMW and Audi. It's just a shame it's got the wrong badge on it. Join us next week on Motor Week with the Seat Leon, the Mitsubishi Shogun, and Ginny driving the Ford Racing Puma.